joining from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett of Neurosurgical TV. Today we have the pleasure of broadcasting the second uh, broadcast of the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. This is webinar number two. Uh, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Bin, uh, Bin Zhu and Yuha for setting all this up. And I'm going to turn it over now to Wan Li Zhao, a director of cerebrovascular surgery at Beijing Pietan Hospital in Beijing. Welcome, Wan Li. It's all yours. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone in the United States. Oh, uh, yeah. And good night, everyone in China. Uh, also, uh, all around the world, if you're hearing. Uh, this is the second webinar of the Chinese Neurosurgical Journal, a special journal uh, uh, from Neurosurgical TV. And uh, we, uh, we just <clears throat> uh, start to cooperate with Dr. John Bernard uh, and his Neurosurgical TV to organize this uh, <clears throat> webinar and every uh, every two weeks and every uh, every for every webinar we will invite two or three uh, speakers all around the world uh, and uh, to introduce their uh, clinical study or basic research experience and we uh, also we wish to uh, uh, <clears throat> have more uh, uh, submission to our neurosurg Chinese neurosurgical journal. So, yeah. And this uh, uh, special webinar will uh, will be uh, monitored by Dr. Uh, Xu Bing from Shanghai Fashan Hospital and, uh, and myself. And tonight we have two uh, speakers, one uh, from uh, John Hopkins uh, Hospital, Baltimore. United States and the other from uh, Harbin, uh, China. It's uh, the second affiliated hospital of Harbin Medical uh, University, Dr. Guo. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I think we can just uh, start. And everyone, uh, are welcome to uh, have some free discussion after these two uh, talks. So maybe Dr. Xu, you can introduce the, the first okay. uh, speaker. So the first speaker is uh, uh, Professor Guo Mian from second affiliated hospital of Harbin Medical University. Uh, so his uh, topic is about the uh, glioma stem cells. Dr. Guomian, so please. Okay, I share my PPT. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you, Professor Xu, for that kind of introduction. Uh, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present my research work on wing in the continuing signaling pathway and the glioblastoma stem cells. Hopefully, more and more excellent articles are published in Chinese Neurosurgical Journal. All surgeons around the world can benefit from it. Okay. Firstly, uh, we all know that glioblastoma is the most common, aggressive, invasive, heterogeneous, malignant, primary brain tumors in adult, and the less common in children. Glioblastoma accounted for the majority of glioma. Median survival of glioblastoma is only 14.4 months. The five-year survival for glioblastoma is only 6.8%. The incidence of glioblastoma is 3.23 per 100 thousand population and still increasing. The standard therapy, including surgical resection, radio and chemotherapy, severe malignance and extensive heterogeneity affected the standard treatments 
and of our prognosis. Given the per survival with current treatment for glioblastoma, new therapeutic strategies are urgently needed. Following the finding of genetic and epigenetic profiling and the immune cells in brain microenvironment, immunotherapy, including CAR T and oncologic viral therapy, vaccine therapy, and the tumor treating cells is still being tested. So far, didn't get more satisfactory results. So treatment of glioblastoma is a great challenge. Okay. This review summarized the uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment in glioblastoma, hypoxia, and the immuno checkpoint play important roles in the failure of immunosurveillance. The glioblastoma microenvironment is hypoxic because of abnormal blood vessel morphology and impairing blood brain barrier. Upregulation of hypoxia related factors, such as HIM and alpha, cooperate with specific immune cells from leaky blood brain barrier to suppress the function of T cells. High expression of PD1 and T cell surface and the PDR1 on tumor cells lead to the energy and the apoptosis of T cells. The functions of NK cells in glioblastoma microenvironment are limited. Glioblastoma stem cells have a high potential of cell new renewal can development. Uh, glioblastoma of varying heterogeneity. Glioblastoma stem cells show greater tolerance to therapies and uh, promote tumor recurrence. Glioblastoma stem cells are located in hypoxic niche of tumor microenvironment. Besides glioma stem cells, many different cells such as microglial cells, uh, microbridge, vascular cells, fibroblasts, and immune cells, such as dendritic cells, leukocytes, and NK cells, take part in the tumor microenvironment. The hypoxic niche contributes to glioblastoma growth and resistance. HIF contributes to the upregulation of VEGF and the IL-8 and supports the stem cell presence. Crucial pathways such as wind are also upregulated in glioblastoma stem cells in the hypoxic microenvironment and associated with the unvaccinated FGMT type and the chemoradio therapeutic resistance. As we all know, notch, hydro, and the wind signaling pathways are considered as stem cell signaling pathways. For a long time, we have interested in the role of wind signaling pathway in the development of brain and the skeleton, as well as glioma tumor genesis. Since wind signaling pathway is highly evolutionarily conserved in animals and identified for its role from embryonic development, and carcinogenesis in various tissues and organs. So we focus on this pathway. Wing signal pathways include the canonical and non-canonical wing signal pathways. All wing signal pathways are activated by the binding of a wing protein ligand to a phrasal family receptor. The canonical wing signal pathway or wing beta canadian pathway is the wing pathway that causes accumulation of beta catenin in the cytoplasm and is eventually translocation into the nucleus to act as an activator of transcription factors that belong to T cell LER family. Without wing beta catenin will not accumulate in the cytoplasm since the destruction complex 
would normally degrade it. The distortion complex includes the following protein. Here, axine, APC, GSK3, a degrade is beta containing by targeting H for UV recognition. However, as soon as they went when the receptor, the distortion complex function become disrupted. The non-canonical planar cell plurality pathway regulates the cytoskeleton that is responsible for the shape of the shell. The non-canonical wind calcium pathway regulates calcium inside the cell. The main feature of wind signal pathway driven cancer is the nuclear location of beta containing in canonical wind with signal pathway. So, this review shows the features of diffuse glioma. IDH well type glioblastoma usually presents short clinical history. They are characterized by upregulation of wind with canadian signal pathway where mutation of IDH result in decreased activity of wind with clinical signal pathway. That in turn decreased proliferation and the migration of glioblastoma. In the last slide, we saw the canonical wind and the wind with the canine signal pathway are the same. IDH1 <coughs> mutation reduced the malignant progression of glioblastoma by causing a less aggressive phenotype of glioblastoma stem cells. Opposed wind with the canine signal pathway activity is observed between IDH well type and IDH mutation. Glioblastoma. And this could be included in glioblastoma classification. This could be one of the reasons of more malignant behavior in IDH wild type glioblastoma. So, being <clears throat> signal pathway plays an important role in many human cancers. Although new mutations in the major components of pathway or alternations in the pathway. It has been reported that the continuous activation of beta continue in tumors. These findings confirm that there are other factors contribute to activation of beta continue and its downstream pathways. Here, we list the crosstalk among wind and some cancer cell progress progresses, including no coding RNAs, oncogenetic signaling, autophagy, drug resistance, apoptosis, stem cell maintenance, epigenetic regulation, and the glucose metabolism. So linked beta containing signal pathway is so important for glioblastoma malignancy. This review shows the potential benefits of inhibiting wind with the continuous signal pathway in glioblastoma. Wind inhibition could decrease stemness of stem cell, prevent tumor invasion, and decrease therapeutic resistance. Wind inhibition impacts glioblastoma vesicle nature by blocking angiogenesis. Signal inhibition results in increased blood brain barrier permeability, arrowing for improved drug delivery. Okay. This is my previous work. I studied the protein cyclopenia A in my postdoctoral area and I still focus on this protein now. Cyclopenia A was first found by binding with immunosuppressant drug cyclosporin A. Cyclopenia A is the PPIAs, which assist protein folding and trafficking, and it was found to be overspread in various types of cancer. This review summarizes the functions of cyclopenia A. Cyclopenia has important roles in many biology conditions 
including protein folding, trafficking, and T cell activation. Current research suggests that cyclophenia involves in cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, aging, viral infections, inflammations, and cancer development. We first compared the brain and the skeletal phenotypes in cyclophilin wild type and the knockout mice by micro CT and immunohistochemistry. Cyclophilin knockout mice demonstrate lower bone mineral density, reduced osteoblast and increased osteoclast numbers. As present levels of chondrogenic differentiation occurs, and transcriptional regulators was all significant lower in simply now count chondrogenic cells. This indicates that cyclophilin plays a functional in brain and skeleton development. Cyclophilin is present in test in concentration in the brain. We then analyze the expression of cyclophilin in brain tumor. Firstly, we found that the expression of cyclophilin is increased in various cancers. We then examine cyclophilin expression in glioma through so analysis of GEO, CCG, and TCG databases and the clinical samples. Cyclophilin expression was higher in multiple types of glioma and upregulated with tumor progression. Patients with cyclophilin or expression have shorter survival time based on CCG and TC databases. This work below shows the glioblastoma stem cells isolation from the clinical samples and the preparation for next experiments. Still in GU database, we compare the neural spheres and the primary tumor, cyclophilin upregulated in neural spheres, which contains more glioblastoma stem cells. After induced differentiation, the cyclophilin levels are regulated. We now call cyclophilin and the found stem cell markers like uh, nesting CD133, SARS-2, and the NINOG decreased by a series of assays. The data suggests that high levels of cyclophilia in glioblastoma, especially glioblastoma stem cells, cyclophilia they care for maintenance of glioblastoma stem cells. To assess the role of cyclophilia in cell renewal of glioblastoma stem cells, we use the limiting dilution method Neurosphere acids and the BRDU acids in cyclophilin knockout glioma stem cells. The data confirm that cyclophilin plays an important role in glioblastoma stem cell self renewal. Because cyclophilin is important for glioblastoma stem cell maintenance, we next investigate whether cyclophilin is involved in radio resistance in glioblastoma stem cells by went blood. We expose glioblastoma stem cells to increasing dose of irradiation and the increasing time. Cyclophilin was promoted by irradiation. Survival fraction and the flow cytometry analysis further demonstrated that cyclophilin knockout reduced the ability of radio resistance. The patients uh, with glioma was divided in high and low cyclophilin expression groups in TCGA. We did the gene expression and the passive analysis. Cyclophilin takes part in the process of wind. Ingenuity pathway analysis further confirmed that high correlation between wind signaling pathway and the cyclophilin. Okay. We next perform RT-PCR based on below the surface assays to check with being vinyl signal pathway in cyclophilin knockout cells, as we expected. The being vinyl signal pathway targeting GE 
and activities were reduced in some free knockout cells. Since beta continuum is the key mediator of link beta continuum pathway, we thought uh, maybe some free functions through beta continuum. So next, in clinical samples, we found that the level of self-free and the beta continuum were both elevated in our graduates of glioma. Pearson correlation analysis showed positive correlation between self-free and the beta continuum. Immunohistochemical staining revealed that nuclear location of self-free and the beta continuum were closely correlated. Okay, we next investigate the mechanism since beta continuum functions by nuclear translocation. We test whether sacrifice help beta continuum translocated to the nuclear. We performed based about the immunofluorescence analysis. In beta continuum, our sacrifice now called glioblastoma stem cells and found beta continuum accumulation in the nuclear didn't require sulfate. However, sulfate is only able to translocate it into nucleus in the presence of beta continuum. Next, we performed product and the co-IPIC and the found sulfate, beta continuum, and the TCL4 bonding together. Chip assays confirm that the sulfate could regulate the interaction between beta continuum and TCL4. Finally, the experiment in vivo further confirmed that the important role of sulfate in wind beta continuum signal pathway. We now collaborate with Professor Tian from Harbin Institute of Technology in clinical translational research by targeting sulfate at the beta continuum pathway. We use stereotype take technology to inject biomaterials containing nano pattern embedded embodied like sulfur antibodies into the tumor cells in order to target the protein of interest. We also work <laughs> with Professor Tian to culture glioma stem cells in 3D biomaterials to simulate the tumor microenvironment and develop bio sensing system to monitor cell self renewable and the proliferation in 3D system. In summary, wind with the continuous signaling plays an important role in glioblastoma stem cell maintenance. This process requires sulfonate precipitation, sulfate bending with beta continuum and how beta continuum interact with certain factor TCF4 to activate the pathway. We now collaborate with Professor Tian of Harbin Institute of Technology and Professor Robert Chu and Shen Hu of UCLA. I appreciate their helping us. That's all, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Guo. Uh, uh, I think uh, maybe we can uh, have the second speaker uh, finish the talk and then we, uh, we do some uh, free discussion uh, together with those two, uh, two uh, speech, right? Okay. That's fine. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me introduce the second speaker, Dr. Uh, Wu Yang Yang, he, uh, he is now, now the uh, PGY5 or 6, uh, 5, okay, uh, the neurosurgical resident from Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. <clears throat> so today he will uh, give us a talk uh, focused on the uh, uh, AVM uh, atrial venous malformation treatment. Actually, Dr. Young, uh, I remember he uh, uh, wrote the, the, the first uh, uh, 
article published on um, the first uh, <coughs> issue of our Chinese Neurocircle Journal in 2015. And now the, uh, that article had the most citation numbers from our journal. Okay, please, Dr. Yang. Thank you. Um, I'll try to share my screen right now. Uh, let me see. Um, um, I might have to rejoin, uh, Dr. Bennett. Is that okay? Um, you might have to what? I might have to quit and rejoin because uh, my Zoom is a new setup. So in I need to set up my, I need to click on something. Okay, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah and sure, sure, sure. Okay. We'll take, we'll take yeah, a digital yeah, coffee break. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. So we, so maybe we can have some discussion about the, the Dr. Gore's topic. Sure. Right. Is sure. he still there? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ko, I think Ko Mian, can you yeah. Yeah. Uh, reshare your PowerPoint? Uh, the last slides you said you, uh, you okay, have so uh, plan. Maybe for... we can just uh, let Dr. Yang do his talk and then we mm -hmm. discuss later. Yeah, he's coming okay. back, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very quick. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Let me see. Oh. I think you, you just qu quit the, the share screen. Yes. So um, we still don't see it yet. We don't see it yet. Okay, hold on. Let me see. Okay, we're getting All there. Right. We're getting there. Not yeah. Can you hear? Okay. Yes. Can you perfect. hear me and see me? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Wuyang. Uh, I'm one of the PGY fives at Hopkins. Um, and my talk today will be focusing on uh one of the risk factors for AVM rupture. Um, uh, with a little bit of uh, general background on AVMs. Uh, I have no disclosures. So AVM says many people here know that uh, it's a tangled web of uh, abnormally formed arter uh, arteries and veins. Uh, it's direct connections between arteries and veins and with no capillaries in between. Um, to describe an AVM structure, you must have three components. Uh, so it, it must have a nidus. Um, it, it needs to have feeding arteries or a uh, feeding artery or arteries. Uh, it needs to have draining one uh, draining vein or draining veins. So some of those are not the case. Uh, very, in very exceptional cases when AVM ruptures, uh, you will see the draining vein actually going away. And on angiograms, you will see that the, uh, the AVM uh, only has a nidus and feeding arteries without early draining veins. And that's common because that's, uh, you know, that's probably the prothrombosis of the draining vein that caused the rupture. So it doesn't mean that it's not an AVM. It just means that the, uh, the veins has priorities from both. So AVMs as an appearance, uh, this is an abstract picture of the AVM. It looks uh, horrendous. And if you look at that on the Wiki's, uh, Wikipedia, the pathological uh, uh, slides, that the whole lesion uh, is just basically uh, abnormally formed vessels. And it, you know, in some cases it does it is when you open up the brain, it just looks like a tangled, um, a bag of worms, basically. <laughs> so um, the most definitive way of diagnosing AVM uh, is angiogram. Um, on MRIAs and CTAs, uh, CTAs are probably better than MRIAs, but um, you know they still have a probably close to two to 5% of false positive and false negative rate. So angiogram is the more definitive way. And it doesn't mean that it's 100% uh, uh, positive or negative. Uh, it's, it's probably close, uh, it's around 99%. A lot of the patients have initially uh, negative angios for AVMs and then they show up later, uh, you know, in a week after, you know, especially for ruptured AVMs that when the hematoma is compressing on the AVMs, they, 
typically do not appear on the first angio scan. So uh, the practice here is normally get the first angio if it's, if it's negative, then get a second angio in a week. And, uh, you know, a direct visualization of the lesion, you know, this is a more, this one is a more benign looking one. Uh, you know, it, it basically has a small anitis. Uh, you can see the arterialized draining veins over here. Uh, it, it can be mistakenly mistaken by, by arteries, but, you know, if you start, uh, you know, feel, you know, get the tactile feeling of the, of the, uh, of the arteries or the veins, you can get a differentiation between them. And uh, a more ominous looking one uh, for this one was from one of the uh, journals uh, published by Dr. Freelander in Pittsburgh um, that shows this gigantic lesion, big overdraping draining vein, um, and all this, what we call serpentipotus, or, you know, what I thought was initially was a bag of worms. You literally open up the dura and open up a bag of a can of worms. And um, we don't see this much often uh, now because uh, most of these gigantic lesions are referred uh, for radio surgery now. So we don't really open up the, those uh, as much now. So, um, you know, AVMs, there are a couple of ways to describe the lesion. Um, we, I typically think of it as um, two major fe features. The AVM has both a feature of a brain tumor and also a vascular lesion. So it has a mass effect. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a description of size, you know, whether or not, you know, based on spasmodic grading, uh, it's either less than three, three to six or six. Uh, you can describe the shape, whether it typically it's a coned, uh, cone shape, like a, 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 a larger cone on, on the superficial surface and narrowing down to, uh, to the deep side. And that's a typical ex appear, uh, experience of the uh, appearance of the AVM, but it, it can also appear as a round one, especially in the deep, uh, like where the AVM is uh, very deep. And location of the nidus can describe compactness and diffuses, but you know, it, there's a lot of ambiguity whether how to describe the AVM diffuseness. And uh, AVM does not necessarily has one big single thing, a nidus. It can have multiple nidus uh, comp uh, compartment lies into uh, into like one big thing compartmentalized into different nidises. And you can have multiple AVMs, especially in HHT uh, patients. And AVMs as a vascular lesion, uh, it does have feeding artery, has draining vein, you can describe it as deep or superficial, as aneurysms, uh, some papers describe it as type one, two, three, where reality is more like a prenidal, intranidal uh, or unrelated. And uh, you can describe it as high flow or low flow. And uh, here's an example of diffuse versus a compact nidus. It's very hard to tell. This is a very extreme, uh, you know, extreme example of how diffuse or how compact the nidus is. But in, in the real world, it's very hard to, cross, uh, to draw the line which one is diffuse and which one is compact. And you, there you have a prenidal and some intranidal aneurysms. So you can see here is a prenidal one. And here, you know, it's there, there, if you look on the arterial phase, there are multiple intranidal little aneurysms over here. So um, when talking about AVMs, uh, you know, obviously uh, the mass effect lesion is, uh, is part of it, but most of most part is, is vascular uh, characteristics, meaning that what are you, uh, you know, what, what is the risk of leaving it alone? And, um, and to describe that, you have to know the natural history of the AVMs. And, um, you know, with describing natural history, there are a couple of risk factors. And when you counsel the patient, normally the, 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 um, the quoted risk is about two to three. I'm sorry, uh, is someone uh, on the... Oh, perfect. Thank you. Right, so I'll address that. No problem. So the, the, the quoted risk is about two to 3%, but in reality, it can vary a lot from under 1% to, I will show you uh, some papers that shows that it can be as much as 20% to 30% per year. So you really cannot just tell the patient, oh, it's two to 3% per year and that's, and let it be. 
So, um, you know, for AVMs, intracranial hemorrhage is the most common presentation. Uh, you know, they they suffer a lifelong risk of hemorrhage. So you really do have to follow this patient's lifelong and if they're not obliterated. And um, the, the hemorrhage risk uh, was quoted to be 2 to 4%, 2 to 4% now being revised to 2 to 3%. It's not a big change. Uh, what's a really big thing is that what are the risk factors leading to the hemorrhage and how big of a change can it be uh, with, with or without those risk factors? So a social risk factors can significantly modify this risk. And I will show you some, uh, some, uh, some of the papers. So this is one of the landmark papers of natural history of ABMs by uh, Dr. Brown from Mayo Group. And uh, they have 168 patients followed. Um, 166 have complete follow-up information with mean follow-up of 8.2 years. Um, the follow-up was from diagnose to, diagnosis to intervention or death or loss of follow-up. Um, this is a little bit controversial now because um, ABMs were initially regarded as a congenital lesion. Um, probably not anymore because um, there are definitely reports uh, of de novo AVMs. Uh, there are definitely reports of AVMs uh, spontaneously obliterating. Uh, there are reports of uh, pediatric AVMs that are born with it. So it's very hard to say that whether or not these are actual, uh, all of them are congenital lesions. And um, the NR risk quota here is 2.2%. And if you rupture, if it's 30% mortality, and the mor morbidity and survival is 22, uh, 23%. So the size of the AVM uh, hypertension are of no value in predicting rupture, which is very, um, which is actually contradictory to what we perceive, but this is what the paper shows. And uh, this is one of another landmark paper by uh, the Costa. So their entire cohort, the annual risk is 4.1%, but I wanna show you something over here. So this paper starts to dig into a little bit more of a how, net, how risk can be modified with different factors. So if a patient has a hemorrhagic presentation, you will see that the risk doubled to a 10% per year. And that means the patient uh, survives for five years or 10 years, their risk of hemorrhage will probably be close to 100% if they have an initial hemorrhagic presentation. And if they have a seizure, their any risk dropped down to 3.5%. And why is that? Because when they present a seizure, they go, to, they go to see the doctors early. So they don't wait for a rupture presentation to, to occur before seeing the doctor. So the ABM at that point was probably hemodynamically stable at that point. So they were followed for longer, they were treated, or they were observed. So their annual risk is slightly, slower, uh, slightly lower. And if you have associated aneurysms, you can increase that, that rate by 3%. Now, it may not seem a lot by increasing 3%, but it's a 3% per year rate. So if a lifelong risk, uh, if you have a patient of expected left, uh, left expectancy of 20 years, you're increasing that by 40% of overall lifelong cumulative risk. So that's a, that's a big deal. And, as I said, uh, brain ABMs presenting with hemorrhage with deep venous drainage or associated aneurysms have a two-fold greater likelihood of future hemorrhage. Uh, and that was demonstrated in this paper. And um, the Finnish study. So this is a very, uh, very famous study that, uh, that Dr. Uh, Herne Sniemi was uh, a prominent surgeon at, at, at fin uh, Finland. I, I believe he's now in, in, in China. Uh, practicing. Um, but this is a big cohort. They have a very long follow-up of 15 years, close to 15 years. They have a very limited population, single race, uh, no pop, almost no population influx or efflux. Uh, it's an unselected population. All of the Finland uh, AVM patients go to their single center to, to get treated. So it's a very comprehensive, no selection bias study. So the patients will follow from admission to death. And that's, in my opinion, a better way of following uh, as opposed to following them from birth to death um, because you can't really assume that the ABM is congenital. And what they found 
is that their annual risk is 2.4%, not too much of a difference from other papers. And they found that the previous rupture, large size and deep location with higher risk of hemorrhage. So the size over here is really contradictory to what the, uh, the, initial, the, the previous studies found, that large size actually, um, actually contributes to more likelihood of, uh, of hemorrhage. And uh, the Columbia group um, found that, uh, you know, in a two, 622 uh, consecutive patients, uh, their, their uh, risk of hemorrhage, the risk factors of hemorrhage are age, incidental, uh, incidental hemorrhage meaning that they, the patients presented with hemorrhage, deep location, deep venous drainage only, and size doesn't really matter. And this is a, this is a slide I'm talking about. So basically when the patient has no hemorrhage, okay, no hemorrhage, it's not a hemorrhagic, a hemorrhagic presentation that presents with seizure or something else, the annual risk can be as low as 0.9% per year. So does it really make sense for us to treat a 60 year old or 70 year old if their risk is 0.9% and you do a craniotomy on those patients? It's, it's in a gray zone, it's hard to justify. But if you have a patient with hemorrhagic presentation and all the risk factors combined, deep location, deep venous drainage, your rupture risk it's notice the annual rupture risk is 34.3%. So give, give the patient two years or three years, they will rupture. So in that case, if it, even if the patient is 60 years old, 70 years old, even they, if they cannot tolerate craniotomy, you, you would try to seek some other solutions, maybe radio surgery, you know, embolization plus radio surgery, but you will have to treat those lesions. So it, it this risk factors, they give a lot of uh, weight. Uh, the, the, the treatment decision gives a lot of weight on this risk factors alone. So th these risk factors are very important. And these are the more conventional risk factors for hemorrhage, prior hemorrhages, deep location, deep venous drainage, and associated androids are more uh, established. And um, I'm going to focus on my talk on pregnancy. So. This is a more controversial uh, risk factor, but nonetheless uh, has been established before by previous papers. So, um, and I'm gonna present this case because this case, this patient is actually still in, in, in the hospital right now. We're still managing her and we're planning for doing surgeries next, uh, next week uh, by Dr. Wong. So basically uh, we have a 24 year old uh, African-American female uh, who was pregnant eight weeks um, and expecting to electively abort because it was an unexpected pregnancy. And she notified in the family in the evening that she had a severe headache and she was on the phone with grandparents who here heard her pass out. And she was lucky because she had a very big IVH. And when EMS arrived and found her down on the bathroom floor, she's basically GCS3, pupils blow, and she's, you know, cardiac arrest and all that. So she was transferred to JH, uh, JHH and uh, she was GCS3 TR arrival. Uh, and then EV, the EVD went in immediately. And after EVD went in, the pupils became a reactive. And here are her images. You can see that it was a pretty horrendous uh, IVH with complete casting of all the ventricles. And uh, the culprit lesion is this little guy that is parasagittal, single arterial feeder, drains into a deep drainage, uh, straight sinus, and the, the size is just 1.7 uh, centimeters. It's a small AVM. There's no hematoma. Uh, there is no uh, hematoma, meaning that there's no mass effect on the AVM. So this is probably the actual size of the AVM. And it's non-aliquid. It's pericolosal, a little bit, a little bit superior to the colossal, uh, corpus callosum, but it's a little bit higher. So the management decisions, the factors to consider, she's only 24. So she has many, many, many years to go. Um, she is, uh, life expectancy over here is about 75 to 80, 80, year, 80 years. So she has probably a, a good 56 years ago. Small AVN is not eloquent. It's got a single drainage vein. It's got a single feeder. That means the overall uh, structure, the complexity of the AVN is not that great. Uh, it's not that complex, meaning that is 
better, is good for treatment. And the patient already elected to abort. So that's a good that's a good sign that you know the patient had expressed her wishes that she wants to abort her pregnancy. And that gives us uh, a lot of leeway in, in decision making. And mortality is high if you believe basically if the EMS, if she was not on the phone with her grandmother and EMS was did not arrive in time, she would have brain herniated and died. And uh, we're planning for surgery for her next week. And the fact that, you know, being the, she's first trimester and most of the papers describing pregnancy, AVM parameters are in the second or third trimester, but that's not always the case. And the fact that, uh, and there's an anecdotal story. So basically when I was tr outside her room and one of our other attendees came by and I was debriefing him on this patient that I told him that this is a pregnant patient uh, hemorrhage and came back, you know, came to the NCCU and he immediately turned green because he was, he thought it was one of his, another patient that had a brain AVM and had a rupture. So this is how prevalent this, this problem is, despite what some, you know, despite some papers were saying that this is not an increased risk, but this is, you know, in reality, you see a lot of this in, in the NCCU. And, you know, for in general pregnancy, uh, hemorrhagic stroke account for five to twelve percent maternal mortality during pregnancy, and AVMs attribute to, you know, close to forty percent of all spontaneous intracranial hemorrhages. And it was previously reported to be increased. A recent meta-analysis said it was not, but uh, I'm just going to go through the papers and, and you know and feed, you know try to do some analysis over here. So the one of the papers here, uh, you know, by the Brigham Group is that um, you know, they, they examined only 54 patients. There were five hemorrhages, four patients over 62 pregnancies. Their hazard ratio was 7.9%. That's a big hazard ratio, meaning that if you're pregnant, you're more likely to bleed than non-pregnancies in a seven-fold ways or eight-fold. And um, their an analysis, was, was, uh, analysis was limited by a very small sample size, of course. So this is one positive finding. And there's one, uh, another uh, landmark study in here by, uh, by Xingju from, who is my previous colleague um, in Tiantan. And they examined 979, uh, 979 female patients as a lot, very large cohort. And their rate in pregnancy is actually lower than non-pregnant patients. So what they, uh, you know, what my interpretation of this is that first, um, you know, it's a single racial population and whether or not it generalizes to North American population is questionable because the, the pattern of um, how people were treated uh, and the, the way that the, the, the lesions, you know, whether or not they were treated immediately versus they will, they will wait and uh, how the patients were followed are vastly different. So um, there was a lack of follow-up uh, but mostly because that they, these lesions were secured very immediately after they hemorrhage, so that's a that's a practice difference between between uh, between Tiantan and, and here. So uh, I'm just going to dig in that in a little bit more. And uh, we had a paper uh, before that showed uh, there was increased uh, hemorrhage in pregnancy that's about fivefold, uh, which is in generally uh, you know in, incoherent with uh, uh, being coherence with the Brigham paper. And our reproductive age patients were from 15 to 50, which is defined by US Bureau of uh, Census. And, and then this systematic review and meta-analysis. So they basically included seven eligible studies and three were included for analysis. And uh, they what they evaluated was the risk of first hemorrhage of brain AVMs during pregnancy. So, regardless of how many pregnancies you have, uh, how many hemorrhages you have during the pregnancy, they only evaluate the risk for first hemorrhage. And they found that there's no conclusive evidence of increased risk of first hemorrhage during the, uh, during, uh, in their paper. Um, but then there was some ambiguity in, in language in that paper that actually generalized to the risk of hemorrhage overall. So that's one, uh, one of my critics over here for this paper. 
So there are several points of this paper makes it makes it interesting or controversial. So first of all, as I said, they only value on the first hemorrhage risk, ICH risk. So the reason for not including a, a subsequent hemorrhages are that the authors assume that once hemorrhage, the ABMs will most likely be secured. So this are unreasonable to calculate further ICHs during the pregnancy or during uh, in other pregnancies, and that's not the case because. There are papers showing that the rebleeding risk is low within the immediate period. So the general practice over here is that the ABM will wait for the AVMs to cool down, for the hemorrhage to cool down, and then bring the, the patient back later to do to do uh, to perform treatment, either uh, resection or radiosurgery, because we don't want to deal with angry brain. And the the fact that AVM, how likely is the AVM is going to rebleed within one month or two months of time is very like is very unlikely. So that's, that's how we deal with it. And the only studies that we, they include with patients were established, uh, established brain ABM diagnosis and that already make them low risk for hemorrhage. And the authors criticize the inclusion of childhood patients into analysis, whereas you know, in reality, our youngest patient in our cohort is actually 13 years when they, they were pregnant. And because we only include patients of 15 to 50, we have to, we have to exclude a couple of patients. And in that cohort, in the included cohort, the youngest patient is 16 years old. So you really cannot just say, this is, this is a problem of adulthood. And the conclusion of risk of first hemorrhage is equivocal, is ambiguous. So what's the, what is the first hemorrhage? Meaning that the patient hemorrhaged and then they just stop coming. So that's, not the case because the real decision making is that the real reality is that the patient hemorrhage and then they will discuss with the ABF and then what do you do? So are there going to be a subsequent hemorrhages? If they're not, then you wait for a little bit and then see how you treat them. If there are subsequent hemorrhages and the risk is increased in subsequent hemorrhages, not the first one, then you probably will treat it. And that's what we believe over here that for this lady in the 24 year old, that we think there's a high chance that she will subsequently hemorrhage. And that's why we take it out emer emer uh, emergently. And, but their paper has a lot of good recommendations for future research. So I agree that, you know, we should use the WHO definition of childbearing age from 15 to 49 years old, which is interesting because they said papers who included Pediatric patients should not be included, but then their recommendation is to include 15 years old patients. And uh, the duration, and I fully agree with that, that it should be pregnancy and purpurium. And, uh, you know, describe the method of how, how all pregnancy for each woman is captured, document how long each patient spent in the exposure period, report the numbers of previous pregnancies and subsequent pregnancies and stratify the patient by prior history of ICH and record the number of ICH both in and out of the exposure period. And that's very all very important. And I think most of the papers included there are did, uh, did all of these things. So, you know, in summary, what we know so far. So most of this hemorrhage is happening in the second and third trimester. That's, a, that's almost a known fact. Very few happen in the first trimester. There has to be something that, that changed during the second or third trimester in the physiological uh, you know, mechanisms that, that, that uh, prompted hemorrhages. And the risk of increased hemorrhage may remain uncertain during pregnancy, but if the brain aims are combined with high-risk features, you know, like um, intranidal aneurysms, deep venous drainages, uh, you know, deep locations, Premature termination of pregnancy should be should be and can be considered, and that's what we have been doing. That if the pay, if the fetus is viable, even if at twenty eight weeks or thirty weeks, we terminate the uh, the pregnancy and uh, and pursue with treatment. And from reported data, there's either no increase in hemorrhage or five to seven times increase, and mostly in the North American cohort, that is a five to five to seven times increase in hemorrhage risk. And we know that we, what we don't know, you know, what we'll, we know what we don't know is that the mechanisms of possibly increased hemorrhage risk during pregnancy for brain AMs is unknown. And my conclusion and recommendation is that the risk of hemorrhage during pregnancy might be increased. And 
although recent meta-analysis suggests a dis, uh, you know, suggests a certain degree of uncertainty, but again, it's a risk of first hemorrhage, not all hemorrhages. And I think a more consistent study methodology needs to be developed to investigate this problem. So the, the fact that you're examining pregnancy patients toes on your ABM, which is already a rare, rare disease, you don't have a lot of ABM patients, and you have to select all the pregnant patients. And on top of that, you have to select all the pregnant patients, all the female patients that are of child bearing age. So that limits on any single institution that can perform this, uh, this analysis. So I think it needs to be a multi-institutional and it needs to have a large cohort. And if combined with other high-risk features, intranidal aneurysms, prenidal aneurysms, you know, deep draining veins, Pregnancy should be considered for premature termination if the fetus is viable. And here is my slide for a thank you. So I graduated from Tiantan 10 years ago. My mentors, uh, Dr. Tizong Zhao, Dr. Shuo Wan, Dr. Yuan Li Zhao, who's here, are, were my mentors clinically and research-wise. And at Hopkins, you know, I gave tremendous uh, thanks to Dr. Huang, Dr. Tamargo, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Brand. And uh, here are my fellows and students who are, some of them are already residents over here. So Alice and, uh, and Tito and Andrew are all residents over here now. So many thanks. And here are my references. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, I think we, we still have some time for a discussion, right? Uh, so are there any questions from the panel? Hmm? Uh, yes, hello, I'm a consultant in Dubai at the moment. Uh, so I also had uh, recently two pregnant ladies, one of them was very large, uh, five, seven centimeter in eloquent area. But uh, since uh, Dr. Um, uh, Young has gone through all the literature. I just want to ask him what what would he say are the present controversies and 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 future studies. Um, I mean, AVMs need to be tailored. You need to look at many things. And does he really believe that we can solve all these questions with uh, statistics? And 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 what would be the most burning question in his mind thank you right so i i totally agree with you that statistics does not and, and i as i said over here that you cannot just quote a 2.2 to 4 percent hemorrhage risk per year to all the patients for say when you have a patient with very large avms that are pregnant you know that obviously just masks the, the decision making you know whether or not to take it out you know the pregnancy uh, does that increase the hemorrhage risk? So, you know, there are a lot of uh, controversials right now in uh, in a lot of regions, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, in the in, in the areas in AVM for say um, that the one that you mentioned, large, hard to treat AVMs. But what if the patient are pregnant? What if they exhibit very high hemorrhage risk and they're very young? What do you do about it? So in reality, the decision making here is very, very hard. What I say is that for large AVMs, you're probably not gonna take them out anyway. Basically meaning that you, if they're a great specimen at grade four or five, you're not gonna do surgery and expect them to leave the hospital in, um, in a, a good state anyway. So um, you know, in, in those cases, it's really dependent on whether or not the patient has intranidal and prenidal aneurysms, uh, you know, whether or not they're deep drainage, whether or not they have rupture before, and what mean that how how hyper risk this aneurysm uh, is, is this ABM is, and if they are very highly very high and you know high rupture risk, I would suggest you know think you know try to see whether or not a peripheral treatment, meaning that embolization with radio surgery, it makes sense for them. Um, and there are other controversials right now. For say, what if you have a pediatric patient? Uh, with very, very deep thalamic AVMs that had bled before, how would you treat those? Like, are you going to leave those alone? Absolutely not, because they're, they're 10 years old. They have 70 years to live. 
but there's thalamic AVMs. If you take them out, they will just they will just be hemiparatic for the rest of their lives. So there's a lot of treatment decision makings uh, that are, that should be as exactly as you said should be tailored to the patient. Now, statistically speaking, I think what statistics gives us is that a general estimate of what uh, how risky your lesion is. For say, if you have a lesion that's superficial, small, you know, non-deep drainage, non-deep uh, drainage has been observed for many, many years, um, that gives you a sense that this is not gonna be a high risk and you can continue to observe it. But then if you have a you have an ABN that's deep, you know, AB, uh, aneurysms, deep drainage, rupture before, that gives you a general bracket that's saying this ABM is probably going to rupture subsequently and you should probably do something about it. So I think that's what statistics, statistics uh, help us in decision making. Now, the, the, the last question you ask is what in my mind is the most pressing. Um, I think there needs to be a way, and exactly as you said, non-statistical way to give you information based on your prior experience, what would this AB, how would this ABM need to be treated? And um, you know, I have something in mind, uh, it's, it's not established yet, but you know, apparently, so think about this, so when you're reporting papers, you're actually reporting your own database. Um, you're reporting a summarized component of your database. You're not, actually selecting a sub-cohort of patients from your database to tailor on the patient that you currently treat. You're basically just general, general reporting on the summary of all your, your database. Now, that's why we have so many papers divided into deep AVMs, superficial AVMs, pediatric deep AVMs, pediatric superficial, pregnant AVMs, pregnant pediatric AVMs. So will there be a future way of actually real-time getting all those data and tailor to one patient, I think there will be, but it, it, it does need, need to take time. And patient privacy apparently is one of the big concerns in this in these platforms. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, Dr. Yang. Yes. Uh, so you, you mentioned the preg uh, pregnancy. Is it uh, including the time of the uh, to give a birth because it does. You know, it does. It, it does. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. so, so is it a different pregnant. in the different way to give the birth? Most of our patients in our cohort are vaginal delivery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, okay. I I have a look at the different there's not uh, there's not enough data or there's not enough patients to actually stratify these patients based on you know different factors because the most, you know, the largest database I've seen in North America so far is probably either the Virginia or the Columbia database. They have a thousand patients, a thousand five hundred patients. Of course, Tiantan has like four thousand. But you know, if you select those by female patients, childbearing age, that have complete follow up, you're basically selecting one fourth of your database. And this does not give any, you know, this probably you have like around four two hundred patients, and it, it does not you cannot really stratify those patients. The sample size is too small. Yeah, yes, and then- I, it, 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 Yes, I agree. I also looked into this literature as well, actually. That's true. Uh, we just don't know about the, the cesarean section versus the vaginal delivery. And generally it is being thought vaginal uh, uh, delivery is safe, but then you have to use some common sense as well, I feel. I mean. If the if the hemorrhage is very fresh, uh, I would rather prefer a C-section under control, to, possibly combined with, with a surgical resection of the AVM. Whereas if the things have stabilized, and as you characterize it as they're being cold, then uh, things change. Uh, things really change. Um, yes, please, please elaborate. Yeah, so... Uh, I've seen questions over here, a great hematoma with ABM stable pregnant patient. As you know, as we, you know, for for the case I've shown here, the reason why we operate on her is because um, you know, she basically presented with a horrendous heavy age. It's 
you know, we, we generally think that if she were to hemorrhage again, she probably won't survive. So that's why we operate. The general uh, practice over here is to for, wait for the AVM to cool off, the hematoma to cool off before we do anything about it. That means that, you know, that means waiting for four weeks, six weeks, or even longer. The, the rate of hemorrhage in the first year after first hemorrhage is like what, like 5%. Like, would you actually deal with an angry brain and deal with all those things for a risk of 5%, whereas 95% of patients doesn't really have hemorrhage in the first year? In here, we don't really think that's necessary. So we, can, we basically wait for it to cool off discuss with the patient, what would you want to do? And radio surgery, surgery, you know, treat, pick a, or just observe. Normally we won't observe, and normally those patients, you know, that are deep, we refer them for radio surgery. Yes, I completely agree with that. And uh, it really is important uh, also, you know, in my, in, in my case, it was involving the, the speech area and Perhaps more importantly, all the white matter tracts that connect the speech area, the, the motor speech area, uh, uh, with the posterior, you know, uh, language areas and the motor strip. And interestingly, um, I, my strategy was I would, I waited, we just put an EVD for a start. It had decompressed into the ventricles. So. Yeah. Uh, it had hemiparesis, the lady had hemiparesis, um, pregnancy uh, was discontinued, and then, uh, to my uh, surprise, she made a, a gradual recovery, there was no hemiparesis, she started to walk and talk, and that really changed the picture, but that took about four weeks, and I had already done an angiogram, and I was prepared and studied everything, uh, to, to actually go in if she played again and just go for broke. So that would have been my approach again, cool, letting it cool off. And uh, yes, uh, because of her age, I would have risked uh, a major deficit possibly. I mean, you never know with your surgery, but uh, I would have risked it if she had acutely replayed. Agreed, uh, agreed, yeah. Agree. Those are different from aneurysms. The aneurysms need to be secure, but AVMs are dealing with a lifelong risk. It's not that they will just rupture right away. And um, yeah, Lee Ma was asking whether or not there was any difference of morbidity after rupturing AVM during pregnancy or not exposure period. That's a good question. Short answer is I don't know, <laughs> because um, as I said, like you, you take one fourth of your entire database on pregnant patients. And then you have like what, five to nine hemorrhages. So you're only, you only have data on nine patients altogether. So can you stratify those patients? For sure, but it will not generate any um, actually use of, you know, actually meaningful data. So um, I think we, there's probably need, the need to actually Gather more patient, you know, multi institution effort to, to d address this problem. This is a pressing problem. This is something that we're dealing with like every once a month or something like that. Okay, oh, Dr. Dr. Kuo Mian, are you there? Kuo Mian. Here. Yeah, you mentioned that you, uh, I, I think in the last slides, you mentioned uh, some future plan for for this stem cell yeah can you explain it more detail right. yeah hmm. yeah there is another Another question also to Guomian uh, from Dr. Hashard Parak. Uh, he asked how regarding stem cell therapy are you using in patient? What are results? And in GBM, how do you make stem cells? Okay. So there are the 
a protocol online to isolate the glomus themselves. So it's very, uh, a very, very common uh, for gloma stem cell research. So we got the we got the uh, gloma sample and cut the sample to species and uh, digest the, the samples. Use the uh, magic beads with the antibody targeting the uh, stem cell marker on the uh, such as uh, CD one hundred thirty three antibody and then another antibody, uh, antibody to isolate the stem cells. So after we, we select the, the stem cells, so how do we next do the gene testing to make sure the cells we isolate is glioblastoma stem cells. So there, there are the protocol on the line. So we use this method. So you know for uh, gloma, uh, in the past uh, past 33 years. So there has been no significant progress in the treatment of glioblastoma. So there are so many methods like immunotherapy, in, including CAR T, uh, ontoviral uh, therapy, vaccine therapy, uh, tumor treating fields. But the medium, the mean survival for glioblastoma is only more than 10 months. So maybe another, we derive another method to target the, the, the globastoma. So we work with uh, Dr. Qian from uh, Harvey Institute of Technology. We use uh, uh, this method uh, the inject, inject the biomaterials uh, with the nanoparticles and, um, and bad. The, the antibodies to the protein we interested to target the uh, the uh, glioma stem cells maybe a new method so we hope that we hope we can get the uh, idea result oh that's all Okay, great. So, Dr. Yang, uh, Professor Yang, you, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, a recent paper of UCSF uh, suggested that the hemorrhage during pregnancy typically recovered well. So yeah. So, how about your case? You mentioned uh, uh, one case in very serious condition. Right. After so, the she's, she started following commands. Uh -huh. She started following commands uh -huh. like a few days ago. So I think, so she's one week out, uh, one, one or two week out. Um, she came in with complete, uh, you know, GCS3T um, extension in all extremities. The left side almost, you no. Know, well, the left side doesn't really move, but now she's following commands consistently. And that's given only one or two weeks. And it's actually, as you know, the previous question was saying, you know, the doctor uh, would tell that Woodley that, you know, this patient's um, unlike aneurysm patient that they rupture, you know, if you don't have a good blood pressure control, they rupture immediately and they, they have a poor subcranial hemorrhage that gives them a very poor prognosis. The AVM patients, um, you know, in, in some part, they behave differently that they, even if they rupture, you cool them down, they, they generally recover pretty well. So, you know, I think, again, like, I think this is not, you're dealing with a bomb, like a AV, uh, like an aneurysm right now. This is more like you're dealing with a more of chronic lifelong risk that you need to, you need to prevent these patients from having a, uh, like a catastrophic hemorrhage in the, in the long run as opposed to you're dealing with some kind, of, some kind of immediate hemorrhage or immediate uh, poor prognosis. Yes, if, okay. I, if I may add to that, um, uh, of course, once, once it has stabilized, you still need to treat it and you need to evaluate it with all the very well-known criteria and discuss it with the patient to go for a treatment and consider surgical treatment. I mean, Surgical treatment is the ultimate thing, and it is so much easier once you have very good planning 
Having said that, I have dealt with acute um, AVM bleeds, and they were primarily not recognized as such, which is often a very unpleasant situation because you find yourself evacuating a hematoma. You don't quite know how much you will get, but that also seems to work. And one last remark I would like to make. I, I was a, a trainee of Professor Yazagil at the time in Zurich, and and he used to say, you know, uh, AVM patients, he's not so worried about them uh, getting into coma. So low GCS uh, means uh, something entirely different from aneurysm bleeds. It, it, really, it really has not the same meaning. And interestingly, if you look at all the criteria published by previous authors and so forth, the GCS scale is, is not, not, I mean, you just looked at the literature again, but I don't think the GCS scale plays a major role, is it? No, exactly. That is, is you know, even if they, they present with GCS 3T, right now she's like calling commands. So it's it's vastly different from, from Anderson rope bleeding. I agree. So, Dr. Yan, do you have any experience about uh, the, the medical uh, treatment, uh, like uh, Lipto? Yeah, I know. So, so there was, a, I saw a trial yeah. uh, for atorvastatine for ABM conservative management, uh, which has also been the trial for, uh, you know, the drug for subdural, chronic subdural hematoma treatment recently. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know the mechanism for that. Um, I don't have I don't have experience in that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed uh, Professor Chen Xiaoling is here. Do we have uh, yes. some comment? Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Yang. Hey, no time, no see. Okay. <laughs> so, as the you know, the AVM definition for the AVMs. That is the feeding artery connected to the venous vein uh, with the needles. That means the directly with the feeding artery and, and venous vein. So that means hemodynamic is a very important role, a very important factor for the development and the rupture of any any presentation for AVMs. But my question is that do you have any idea about the hemodynamical research about of the hemodynamical clinical applications in your hospital of any comments for their research? Now, so that's a very good question. So we don't have research for that currently. I was thinking about that, but as I, you know, right now I'm in the vascular fellowship and, you know, I, I get a little bit more into like how the angiogram appears. But what I would say that is that it's not uncommon um, for AVMs that presents with a rupture that their initial angiograms are negative. And then one week later or two weeks later, they reappear. So you might call that, so there are a couple of ways to think about this. So you mentioned that there's arteries, arteries, veins, and nidises. Now, is it because of the hematoma compressed on the AVM nidus that close off the vein? or close off the nidus so that they initially became like negative. And then one week later, they they reappear, it could be. But then they, it also could be that their draining vein closes off completely. And then they hemorrhage. And then they recanalize the draining vein. And, and then they become, so I've seen, I've definitely seen uh, it's a hemodynamic, uh, very dynamic uh, lesion. It's uh, definitely seen de novos. I've definitely seen recurrence. It means that the AVM's lesion is completely resected. And then you get a recurrence like in the adjacent area. And then they definitely can go away spontaneously. They, can, they definitely can get bigger. And they definitely can present as a negative and recanalize afterwards. So I think it's a very good promising area to, to investigate on, like how this, this lesions behave. But the problem is that in order to get all of those, you will have to 
regularly follows patients with angiograms, which is not possible, probably. M MRI, CTAs doesn't really tell a thing, in my opinion. Like they tell where the AVMs are, but you really have to see the dynamic, like hemodynamic uh, flow through under the angiogram to actually know what the structure is. Yeah, so, you know, it's very hard for telling the patient to come back every six months to do an angiogram. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, because I, we think the human human dynamic is very important, but nowadays there's no so uh, general general hemodynamic parameters in the clinical, you know. So that's why I'm thinking maybe we can get some 4D CTA or 4D angiography or some parameters that could be measure hemodynamic status. Yeah, yeah, agree. Yeah. So why? Maybe we can find something. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a very interesting change, but especially you know when doing angiograms on previously radiated patients, that when they radiate, um, you know patients do you know generally do really well, but then on subsequent and and we typically do an angiogram in uh, six month uh, in a three year time, or actually in a three year time, and then later on if there is there's still residual, we start following those. And uh, you definitely see prematurely draining veins closing off. And probably that's why the some of the radiosurgery patients they bleed, like during the latency period, that they, you know, you can't really control where the draining veins, like where the radiation goes, and the draining veins might pre prematurely close off, and then they started having a hemorrhage. And that's actually one of my, my experience uh two weeks, uh two months ago that. Um, that a patient that was previously radiated came back 15 years later, and we compare the angiogram between now and 15 years, and um, it's very interesting that the deep there are two major drainages in the in, uh, in the patients 15 years ago, and then after 15 years, one of the deep venous drainage actually closed off, and then the superficial drainage veins start getting larger, so. And he presented with hemorrhage. So I, I you know, there's definitely some correlations with that, I think. Yes, actually, right. I also noticed that uh, there's some uh, change in the drainage vein. Sometimes there's some spontaneous thrombosis. In the, yeah. Even in the main drainage, although it's yeah. very fast flow, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interestingly, yeah. it can be form some thrombos, yeah. yeah. And uh, that, uh, that, that's the cause of the bleeding, yeah. That's that's why I think, you know, transvenous embolization is still opening, you know, like it's still to my, in my opinion, a little bit risky. And just because you don't really know whether or not you can actually go into the, you know, into the vein, like, well, the onyx or whatever the glue they're using, are they refluxing, if they reflux a little bit back into the vein, then you're a host, like especially in a single drainage vein, uh, ABM, that you close, you par partially close off that vein, the nidus will explode. Yeah. Yes, I, I totally agree with that one because um, um, I was just going to ask you, I totally agree with uh, Professor Chen that, the, you know, the drainage vein and the vein architecture is the single most important factor for the re-bleeding risk in my opinion the size and, and location is probably more related to surgical morbidity and so on but uh, I was going to ask you know the interventionists have uh, actually they they present very favorable data with blocking the the, the, the veins and uh, really that's what the last thing we would do as surgeons we would go for the vein as the very last thing to uh, we would leave it open. So um, yes, any any more comments on that, please? Um, I just I think that what they're doing is that they you know what the transvenous embolizations are doing is that they transvenously access to the nidus. With if you have multiple arterial feeders, it, it's not possible to embolize. Yes, the theory is that maybe treat this as a possible fistula and then go into the nidus and then obliterate it, the nidus and without hurting the vein. But in reality, um, when you're passing a catheter through the vein, the, especially the drainage vein, like you're occlusive to that vein, like your catheter itself. 
uh, and you are hurting the vein by ca passing catheters and wires over there. So is there is is it possible? You, you know, by reviewing some of the papers, they have pretty favorable outcomes for sure. I, I think you know if. if for most part, you, you're lucky that you, you go into nidus, you just glue off the entire nidus without hurting the vein and hope for the best that you know it doesn't explode. But in reality, you, there's a chance of hurting the vein. Uh, there's a chance that you, the glue reflux into the vein. And if you hurt the vein, you reflux into the vein and close off the vein and cause a hemorrhage, I don't really know how I can defend myself in that case. That's a problem. Like you can achieve 95% good outcome, but that, that 5% is really hard to defend while you're hurting the draining vein in the AVM. Yes. Actually, I am both doing the open surgery and also doing the embolization by myself. I never use the transvenous approach because, you know, just as you mentioned, even 1% if the patient uh, got died, <laughs> how can you yeah. explain it? Yeah. How can you explain? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, some uh, radio neurologist, uh, they still treat it, uh, especially in Europe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, sh I'm sure, you know, with advancement of endovascular, I, eventually there will be a solution maybe transvenous uh, or combined with other stuff to treat this like endovascularly for very selective patients. But at this point, you know, things are exploratory. I can't really say that it will, it can be applied to a regular practice. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I don't like it, but uh, the French school, which is, has been very pioneering in, uh, in interventional, they, um, they do that. Uh, <laughs> And uh, what can I say, you know, the other thing which you uh, actually I, I mean, I'm sure Professor Shu, he knows if he does interventional that the wires actually, these micro wires are extremely soft, so I wouldn't really uh, blame them, but, um, but, uh, but the onyx uh, blocking it the wrong way would probably be the problem, I would think. Okay, Wan Lee. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't, I don't have Thank you for the speakers more. and the audience. Yeah. Uh, the, the accumulated uh, audience number now achieved around the 4,000 for oh, our <laughs> first two. Those are from the days of, of this webinar. <laughs> yeah. From the days of Yoda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow, I'm very honored. I'm very honored. I never mm. spoke to so many people. Thank you. <laughs> well, Martin, it's good to have you, Martin, to bring so some Martin, you, you can uh, you can shoot your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got to get your camera working there, Martin, so yeah, we can yeah, meet yeah. you. So I'd like to thank. I, uh, anything else, Ben? Do we have more questions or anything else you want to do? Okay. Kasak. Takashi Kung, right? Do you have Takashi, any? Yes, Takashi from Japan. Wow. Do you? Uh, yeah. Good evening. Uh, I'm Takashi like Kung from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, oh. Thank you for a very interesting oh. speech and very informative. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Takashi. Okay, so I think we can close this uh, webinar. Uh, Tonight and uh, according to our schedule, we plan to uh, do it every uh, two weeks, and there will be always the Sunday uh, night, so right. uh, Beijing time. Yeah. So right. uh, when we uh, confirm the speakers uh, for our next webinar, we will uh, broadcast. Excellent. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Wan Li. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Wu Yang uh, and Mian, and also Martin and uh, Arshad for interacting. And we'll see you in two weeks. 
Okay. Bye. Bye, bye John. Bye. Bye-bye.